Thanks, Ren. So we're a public company in the UK, uh, so here's our disclaimer statement. And uh, here's a slide that really just encapsulates the business on one slide, hopefully. Uh, so we're an allergenaic cell therapy business. We've been around actually for the best part of 20 years, having been founded out of King's College in London, um, predicated on early behavioral work done preclinically uh, in CNS conditions, and that led us to uh, move towards stroke as uh, a first uh, target. Uh, we certainly didn't set out to make life easy for ourselves. Um, but it was also driven by some very convincing early preclinical data that we garnered from our lead cell asset, which is a neural progenitor cell line, fetal derived, which we call CTX. Uh, that's because it was originally derived from uh, fetal cortex brain tissue and then immortalized using a gene-based technology that we're still using today. Uh, and that line has been around since 2003 and we've taken it through a very extensive campaign of preclinical and early clinical work since then, as well as optimizing manufacturing protocols, cryopreservation protocols, and so on. Um, as Ren said, we've just come out of a phase 2A study in the UK. Uh, we originally did a phase 1 study before that. That was the first in man that we did up in Glasgow. And late last year, we got an IND to move ahead to a phase 2B placebo-controlled study here in the US. Uh, in 40 centers, and we're looking to start dosing patients very soon this year. Uh, we have a second cell asset, a distinct uh, cell asset, again, um, multipotent progenitor cell, this time sourced from fetal retinal, uh, neural retinal tissue, and that's targeting back of the eye retinal degenerative diseases. Uh, the first target here is retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, uh, and we have orphan uh, status and fast-track designation for that program uh, here in the US. Uh, it's currently in a phase 1-2 study, or the, the, the 2A portion of that phase 1-2 uh, at Mass Eye and Ear over in uh, Boston. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will be followed by a phase 2B study uh, sometime next year, both in RP and what we also hope to do, uh, if resources allow, is to move directly into a, a related indication off the 2A data in RP, uh, looking at cone rod dystrophy, which is associated with the loss of cones at the back of the eye as opposed to uh, rods. Uh, we have a third platform which is derived from our CTX cell line, and that is using exosomes harvested from CTX cell expansion. And we believe that those exosomes have both therapeutic potential in their own rights, in their own right in, in cancer, which we're currently testing in a number of uh, preclinical cancer screens. Um, as well as having the ability uh, to act as a delivery system uh, to deliver uh, gene-based or protein-based therapeutics as well, and that we're doing in collaboration with uh, third parties. And finally, corporately, uh, we, our, last round, our last funding round was done uh, back in 2015. It was quite a substantial round for us. Uh, we're still living off those proceeds. We have a runway of around probably 12 to 18 months, depending on how we how fast we drive the programs I've described. Uh, so we're reasonably um, uh, well-resourced cash-wise for the time being. Uh, most of the register is institutional in, in, um, in structure. Uh, we probably have about a 10 to 20% retail base. And we now have sites uh, both in South Wales in the UK uh, and uh, Boston here in the US. Um, again, just quickly to reiterate uh, the source of the cells and the platforms that we're using. So CTX is the neural progenitor uh, uh, product. It's an immortalized line, as I mentioned, uh, and is being taken forward in stroke and also is the source of our exosomes. And our human retinal progenitor cells, uh, this time it's a population of cells, so we expand those cells, non-modified, in low oxygen culture, and that's targeted uh, against retinal degenerative diseases. Um, things to look out for, finally, uh, in terms of uh, what's coming up news flow-wise across those programs. This just gives you a quick snapshot of the next data readouts clinically uh, with our core programs. So the Phase 2B study uh, will read out in the, the very back end of next calendar year, all being well. It's a pretty ambitious recruitment um, uh, uh, program we have for that across those 40 centers here in the U.S., uh, the uh, retinitis pigmentosa study will read out, the phase 1, 2 will read out in full next year, uh, hopefully followed by phase 2B before the year's out next year, and that cone rod dystrophy phase 2 alongside it. And depending on the preclinical workup from here on in and some tox work, uh, we are looking to get our first exosome-based uh, solid tumor candidate 
into a first in man study at some point next year as well. Uh, so with that, I'll hand back to Ren. Thank you. So, I, you know, um, I feel like cell therapies are, are uh, really targeting these incredibly hard to treat uh, disease indications, right? Like we said, ALS is a graveyard. I feel I could be wrong. Stroke is a graveyard as well. Um, a lot of therapies have been tried, but maybe it's because it's missing the cell therapy component that multifactorial. But can you talk a little bit about that? I guess maybe for investors in the audience, as well as um, uh, other potential collaborators, what are the nuances of stroke that you know, people should be aware of? And then, of course, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of a deeper dive into the cl you know, relevant clinical and regulatory endpoints. Yeah, and I think it's a fair point to make. I mean, we, uh, we've obviously been to plenty of meetings, as, as you can imagine, where uh, as soon as you mention the word stroke, uh, eyes glaze over and the graveyard uh, comment uh, typically arises. And I think you picked up on, on the very point that we would say in part to address that, which is, you know, the, the, the field of stroke perhaps requires a new and novel intervention to deal with some of the, uh, the very prominent failures that have happened with more conventional drugs. There's only one approved uh, drug out there right now, out of plays in the acute phase. And that draws me to the second distinction, which is important here, and that is the time of intervention. So with CTX for stroke disability, the key word there is disability. So what we're looking to do is address the consequences of stroke downstream when a patient has survived their stroke but has a residual deficit um, arising. And that will usually manifest and be stable after around three to six months. Um, for us, we're targeting motor as opposed to cognitive deficits. Motor deficits are easier to measure and they are... They are, they are easier to identify in the first place in, in a typical stroke uh, uh, survivor. So we are very much focused in that downstream um, uh, 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 category of stroke patients where they have little, if any, available uh, therapies or, or rehabilitation measures available to them. Um, and if they do have those available, it tends to be sporadic and it doesn't last for any great length of time. And again, the preclinical data that we generated all those years ago led us to believe that CTX could play a role in alleviating the effects of those uh, post-stroke symptoms, those post-stroke motor deficits. We saw them improve initially in rat models of MCA, MCAO, rat models of stroke, and we saw anecdotal evidence right from the phase one study in patients as well. And certainly in the phase 2A study, we had some very interesting data on uh, uh, some of the endpoints we used in that study, including the primary endpoint that we'll be using in the phase 2B study, modified Rankin. So for us, it is a, it's not an easy indication, but for us, it, it's crying out for a novel intervention or approach to go some way to taking these pa patients down a level of dependence, and that is where the pharmacoeconomic argument is for a treatment like this. If we can show a sufficiently a clear differentiation between a placebo control group in a phase 2B study and the patients that get the active treatment. So can you talk, I guess, just a little bit about the phase 2 that you've already shown some results from, and then um, in terms of a path forward, is it standard phase 2, phase 2B, then a phase, you know, large phase 3, or is, is there discussions with regulatory agencies to potentially streamline that? Yeah. So, so for our phase 2B study, it's, uh, it's going to be a 110 patient study, one-to-one uh, -one randomization. The primary endpoint will be modified ranking, which is a measure of dependence. It's a very clear functional measure of patients' dependence. Um, it's a six-point measure, and what we're looking to do, or what we're trying to do, is identify, if you like, the sweet spot of patients within that measure. And on that six-point scale, it's those with a score of modified rank in four or three that we'll be targeting. Because if you look at pharmacoeconomic studies that have been done, and in fact, I may have a supporting slide to illustrate this if I can find it. Yeah, so this slide quite nicely encapsulates, I think, what I'm trying to say. Uh, There's actually a registry study run in Sweden a little while ago, published uh, last year in over 40,000 disabled stroke patients. And it shows you the pharmacoeconomic benefits of taking a patient down a level of dependence on this modified ranking scale, especially from four to three or from three to two. And the, uh, the narrative and the illustrative uh, pictures there give you some indication of what those different measures actually mean from a patient's uh, perspective in terms of their degree of dependence. 
So for us, this is uh, a measure that um, uh, is very appropriate for a, for a larger scale study of uh, disability. Uh, it's been used before in, in studies of disability, both stroke and, and uh, other uh, uh, diseases that result in uh, uh, disability of this type. Um, and it's also one that FDA is very comfortable with. So clearly we had to go to a degree with what the reg we thought and, and found out the regulator was going to, to be most comfortable with and modified ranking certainly uh, ticks the FDA box in, in that sense. Um, other measures that are also appropriate are things like the Bartel Index, which actually is, certainly in our discussions, is rather more favored by the European regulatory authorities or EMA in particular um, as a measure in, in larger scale uh, studies of disability. That's a measure of activities of daily living, but again, very relevant in larger scale studies where one's looking for a clear functional readout. And, you know, modified ranking and Bartella where we, we saw the greatest um, or clearest evidence uh, in our single arm study, in our phase 2A study last year, uh, both at three months and at 12 months uh, in the patients that we treated on those studies. It was those two endpoints that we we saw the, uh, the clearest evidence that there might be uh, biological activity with this intervention. The thing, of course, we couldn't answer was how much of that was attributable to a placebo effect, and that is what this next phase 2B study endeavors to, uh, uh, to find. And is there just, you know, from a competitive, I guess from the competition and a landscape perspective, you know, is there anticipated to be a, much of a placebo effect in these patients? And, and, you know, who do you think are your biggest competitors and, and what are the key differentiating aspects between? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think, I think it would be unwise to think that there would not be a placebo effect of some sort, especially in a neurosurgical intervention like this. So we based our powering of this study and, and the subsequent study that we believe would need to follow it, to pick up on your earlier question, uh, to allow for a reasonable placebo effect. Uh, because I, I, you know, it's, it's undoubtedly the case that, that there will be a measure of placebo effect, at least in, uh, in the short term. Um, sorry, your other question was competition, yeah. Um, Actually, competition is one of the things that we don't worry too much about, other than believing that perhaps there should be more players in this field, and perhaps because of the very challenging nature of the indication, you know, we are uh, in a very, very small and exclusive club. Uh, we quite often get compared to Athesis, and that's a company we're more than happy to be compared with, and we do actually see Athesis as a complementary approach to, to what we're attempting to achieve in stroke, in that Athesis are very clearly focused on the acute phase of the condition using a systemically introduced uh, cell, uh, cell, cell therapy intervention, uh, primarily to modulate the immune effect in the very early stages of stroke, the first 24 to 48 hours or 36 to 48 hours. Um, so if they can have success with their treatment, um, ostensibly it may even open up the uh, potential for enlarging the disabled stroke population that survives, is able to get through that initial inflammatory cascade. Um, other uh, peers that are perhaps more relevant to what we're doing, the one obvious one I can think of is San Bio out of California, where again they are very specifically targeting stroke disability as we are. We're at roughly similar stages of development. They're in a phase 2B study here in the US already, having done an initial phase 1-2A. It's a direct intervention into the brain as opposed to systemic uh, injection of cells. But they're targeting a rather different region of the brain. They're using a different, uh, albeit a modified uh, cell type, a mesenchymal cell in, in their case. Um, and uh, from a corporate perspective, uh, we're both public companies. They have a quote in Japan that gives them a very impressive market valuation at the moment, that's for sure. Um, so I don't think we, we worry too much about the competitive threat. This is an indication that is extremely large. So I think there is plenty of room for successful players who can generate a meaningful uh, 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 clinical effect at phase 2B and beyond uh, to play in this uh, marketplace, if you will. I think pricing will be a challenge. So for, it's always been our belief that an allogeneic treatment is, is an obvious one to go for, for this indication. Uh, but as things stand at the moment, I think you know, the, there are very few players and therefore you know, we see ourselves as, uh, as one of those pioneers that we hope to be able to get all the way through uh, uh, and we're not far off doing that. And just so I, just so from, from my understanding, Sam Bio is about a $1.5 billion market cap. Yeah, and I'm not even going to tell you what our market cap is at the moment. It would be embarrassing in that context. But yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting how valuations ebb and flow and, 
uh, the previous speaker, I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it's also relevant there as well. You know, pure cell therapy companies such as ours have their, you know, their good times and their not so good times when it comes to ability to raise funds, to command valuations. For us, it's about generation of data through well-designed clinical trials. If you can do that, the valuation should take care of itself in due course. So I don't want to let you go without, and we have a break, so I, I can just go maybe one minute um, over. Can you talk a little bit about your work with retinal uh, pigmentosa? There's a lot of work getting done. Uh, maybe just compare and contrast your approach to the, the other approaches I'm aware of are gene therapy approaches. And so, well, you know. I, yeah, I, that's right. I mean, I, actually, again, there is a, you know, there are other cell therapy approaches targeting both RP and also uh, perhaps a dry AMD is rather better known with companies like Biotime, for instance. But JSIDE are out there in California. They're doing, uh, uh, using retinal progenitors against RP as we are. Um, but you're right, gene therapy is where all the real sort of sex and violence has been recently, notably Lux Turner. Obviously, what we would hope to achieve with a gene-independent approach is the ability to, to both rescue photoreceptors and even regenerate photoreceptors at the back of the eye in these retinal degenerative diseases. That's the essence of a cell therapy approach as we see it compared to a gene therapy approach targeting one of the over 200 gene deficiencies in, in RP, for instance. Uh, again, there's room for both, um, and uh, I think we can learn a lot from some of the clinical development pathways that others have followed uh, before us, um, uh, 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 including Spark. And then I think one last thing that you're developing, exosomes, which I know we'll hear more about in the afternoon as well. You know, what can you tell us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the reason we're pursuing it with some vigor now is that because we, ha we have a very, very active and effective producer cell line for exosomes being CTX, which is an immortalized line anyway, so we can throw off exosomes through CTX cell culture in great quantities. Characterization, purification are, are issues we have to crack, but certainly the early data we have is, is, is very exciting in terms of their ability uh, to mediate um, uh, effects in, in cancers, various cancers. We started with GBM, that's where we got some good initial data, but we're looking beyond that at the moment. So we hope to say a little bit more about that over the next 12 months with a view to getting into a first-in-man study uh, next year. But as a business, we're very much excited by the potential of exosomes as therapies in their own right. And I know we're not the only ones. Capricorn and others are also going down that path. Great. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you.